just have that space other life things so but i've probably seen some of you all around at membership meetings and other things so uh, welcome to our session we have three of us presenting um, uh, i did say four originally but one was unable to attend so we're going to each take 15 20 minutes something like that and then we should have lots of time for discussion and things like that so um my presentation as you see here is the dubins examining the history of the cuban jewish diaspora i am going to start by acknowledging that I didn't know crap about Cuba when I was young. Okay, I was schooled in rural Michigan, graduated in 1990, so maybe time period related or maybe space related or all of those things. I pretty much knew there was a Cuban Missile Crisis, there was a Bay of Pigs fiasco, bad man named Castro around the country, like I didn't know anything. And I don't believe that I knew any Cubans. If I did, I wasn't aware that they were of Cuban heritage. Fast forward to 2005, I moved to South Florida where I teach, I started to meet people from Cuba, Cuban, actually literally from Cuba, or whose heritage was Cuban, and learning a little bit more. We're 90 miles from Cuba. We're very close, you know. So in learning that the history of Miami is very interwoven with the history of Cuba, um, both kind of interdependent ways. I never gave a lot of thought to Jewish folks being in Cuba, probably again, just out of ignorance. And I'm sure some of I knew there was probably Jewish people in Cuba, but it never was a thing like that I really kind of actively thought about until about five years ago when I met and started dating my now husband, who is a Juban, a Cuban Jewish person. And they do refer to themselves often as Juban. So just we'll use that term knowing that that's how the other they identify. And I started learning so many fascinating things, not only about Cuba, but about the history of the folks that were Jewish who ended up in Cuba and then fled Cuba, many of them, when Castro took power to land in the United States. A lot of them in Miami, but some other places as well. And there's just this fascinating and rich history that I became really interested in learning from his family. Um, they also are, as a family, but as a community, tremendously successful people in South Florida. And that's just pretty much universally true. And I thought, that's so interesting. You know, I'm a, a family of immigrants also. My history is Irish, Scottish, English, a little bit of Welsh. We're not that successful as a cohort, let's just say. And there's, so there is something interesting, and I'm trying to kind of figure out what that is, that has made this cohort of people so successful, despite having to flee, many of them, Eastern Europe from the Holocaust, and then again from a dictatorship. <laughs> like to start all again two times and to be so successful again is kind of intriguing. So that's a part of my story before I get into kind of the more of the presentation part. Unfortunately, last August, my father in law, Jack, passed away. Uh, he had a blood cancer that he was being treated for, probably would have lived several more years, but he ended up getting COVID when he was hospitalized for COVID. They couldn't give him the blood cancer treatment, and again, he passed away. And he was a great guy, really missed him, miss him and love him. Um, but in conversations with the family, as we all got together to mourn, we shared, people shared stories and I learned even more. And I looked at documents and old photos and, and again, this kind of rich history. And I remember my husband saying, you know, someone should write a book about our family. There's some really interesting stories. And I was like, well, I sometimes write some stuff. He's like, oh yeah, you do. <laughs> I was like, yeah, sometimes I do. <laughs> That's kind of what we do in our, you know, it's academics. I was like, but I've never really taken on this kind of project. But, you know, maybe the seed of something was, was planted. So long story, I guess, to get to the point, uh, this spring semester, I will be on sabbatical, thanks to Plankton University for granting it to me, to conduct in-depth interviews with 30 or 40 members of both his family, but others that are connected to the family, who are all Jubans or legacies of the Juban diaspora, to kind of uh, get some more about that history, about the experiences in the moves from Eastern Europe to Cuba and then Cuba to US or the other places they landed. Right now, I've done some more casual interviews, we'll call it, in order and some research in order to kind of shape what those more structured interviews will look like. Frankly, I'm trying not to do too much of it now. I'm like excited about it, but like they gave me a sabbatical for a reason. So I use this damn sabbatical and not do the work now. So what you're going to hear is kind of a little bit of a background of what I've learned so far, a little bit of the themes that have emerged, and I'm share you a few little photos and family story. So I hope it's as interesting to you as I find it. Um, I did present about this for the first time last week on Tuesday, and thankfully it was well received, and there happened to be in South Florida, so that many Jewish folks, many Cuban Jewish folks, so I have two pages of very chaotic looking notes, because that's how my brain works, of other things to add to the presentation. So this is, that was exciting. All right, so here we go. Sorry about these glasses. I get used to these readers. All right, so just a quick history. 
again, very watered down history, but a quick history of the first Jews to land on the island of Cuba. So the first Jewish folks did come with Columbus. They were largely Spanish and Portuguese Jews who did not want to convert to Catholicism in their home countries. They were referred to as Moranos. Uh, that's what I've read in the literature. Uh, and that's what my mother-in-law explained to me. Somebody in my presentation the other day told me Murano was a derogatory term. I tried to look that up. I did not find that in anywhere, but if it is, I apologize for that. I did try to fact check that to the best of my ability, but um, as I read, they referred to themselves as Moranos, and some of them did help finance, actually, Columbus's voyages. There was another kind of crew of Jewish folks that landed in Cuba, fleeing Brazil largely in the 17th and 18th centuries, and many of them became merchants and were heavily involved with some of that international trade that happened on the island at that particular point. And then another surge came after Cuba gained independence from Spain during the Spanish-American War in 1898. A lot of those folks were American businessmen who got involved in the Cuban industry, which at the time was largely sugar and tobacco. And some of them were war veterans from the United States fleeing, uh, seeking refuge in a warmer or nicer climate. And then another wave came around the start of the 20th century, this time Sephardic Jews from the Ottoman Empire. And this group was slightly different demographically, tended to skew a little bit more poor and engage more in small pet businesses or uh, peddling rather than more uh, significant uh, and well affluent industries. And then the group that my family, my, my husband's family came from uh, was from Eastern Europe. They were all from Poland outside of one person who came from uh, white, uh, white Siberia. And many of them fled from fascism and the oncoming Holocaust in the 1920s through the 1940s. Um, by 1924, as you can see, there's about 24,000 Jews in Cuba. And actually most of them weren't necessarily looking to stay in Cuba. Cuba was going to be a stopping place on their hopes to land in the United States. However, the United States passed several pieces of legislation, including the Immigration Act of 1924, which really severely limited the number of Jews who were accepted into the United States. So many of those people whose intention was one thing ended up staying on the island of Cuba. Some, some came because they wanted to be in Cuba, but there was a sizable group that really intended to land in the United States. So this continued uh, again as people saw the oncoming fascism in, in Italy, uh, uh, in Germany, et cetera, and it landed again, fleeing that and religious persecution. So by 1960, there was an estimated up to 16,000 Jews in Cuba, a fairly sizable part of the population. So then came the second wave of diaspora, right? So these folks were living in Cuba and many of them had established very successful businesses. My husband's <laughs> family uh, were in lumber at one point and in, had a rope making business. And, they had, and one of his family members actually sold rope to um, fairly affluent people and well-known people like Hemingway. Um, most of the Jews that landed in Cuba ended up fairly successful by building businesses there. Most of them left everything behind or their things were seized. But initially when um, Castro was coming to power, many of the Jews and, and many other people in Cuba actually supported that uh, revolution because the previous uh, administration, Bautista, was very much corrupt and a lot of people were ready for change, didn't want him anymore, so were all, all too happy to get rid of him. And initially, Castro did not play up the kind of communist side, the I'm going to seize your businesses side. It seemed initially like a good thing. It became pretty clear to many of the Jewish folks that this was not going to be a good thing. Um, in particular, a couple of developments. In 1959, atheism was declared the national religion making that very difficult practice for Jewish religion or any other, anybody who practiced that religion, but for my purposes, Jewish religion. That was changed in 1962 to declare Cuba a, an atheist state, or, or I'm sorry, a secular state. However, the, the, the pattern was there, right? Chill, chilling effect on practicing your religion. Um, then there was also the nationalization of industry and the seizure of the industries and properties. My husband's uh, family's jewelry business was taken over by Castro. Um, by September 1960, as many as 3,000 Jews had fled the island, and by a couple years later, about 90% of the Jews had fled the island. Many of them to the United States, and in particularly to Miami, obviously due to proximity and similarities to in you know, climate and things like that. But others landed in, in other places, including a, a sizable chunk that went to Israel. Um, so. Um, many there still who remain there were still again scared to practice their religion openly 
but there was a, a small chunk, this was not my husband's family, that did actually support the Communist Party. So I won't be speaking much about that, but just want to acknowledge that. So the best I could find today, there's about 800 to 1200 Jews that remain in Cuba, most again, have left. Um, so this is my husband's family. His dad's name was Beckerman, his mom's name was Shegel. And they all came from, David is my husband, just so you know his name, it's easier than say my husband all the time. Uh, they all, as I said, they all came from Poland, except from the one from White Siberia. Um, his paternal great-grandfather was one of nine um, siblings and only two survived the Holocaust, while his maternal great-great-aunt was, the, and his mother's, mother's side, everyone survived. They fled earlier, um, more in the 1920s when they were younger. Uh, but his maternal great-aunt did survive several camps, and she had a son who was taken away from her and raised in a convent in France until he was 13. Uh, and then she finally was reunited with him. He's still alive. I have not met him yet, but he lives in California somewhere, he's like 86, 87, something like that. Um, David's parent, mom, parents, Jack and Lilia, left Cuba initially for Kansas City. And then they moved to New York and then they landed in Miami where they've been living, well, actually live in Broward County, but nearest to Miami. Um, so they uh, had an interesting story as to why, why and how they left. She was just 15 when Castro came to power. And initially things didn't look too bad. And then they started to see again, curtailing religion, the seizing of industries. There were some rumors that they were gonna send kids to like labor camps, lots of scary times. And so her parents, decided they wanted to send her to the United States. They had some family in Kansas City. They want to send their daughter to go live in Kansas City with a family to be safer for her. She had started fairly seriously dating Jack at the time, uh, even though she was young, 15. He was a few years older, he was 24, I believe at the time. And he learned of her family's plans to send her to the United States. And he said, well, I don't want you to go without me. Let's get married. So they got married. They had a beautiful wedding ceremony. They left Cuba on their honeymoon and have never been back since. Um, and some years later, they had the family join them. So they trickled on over, grand grandparents came over, brothers and sisters came over, eventually everybody that in his family left Cuba, there's no one still there. And his grandfather actually left Cuba having swallowed a diamond so he could have something when he got to the United States, which I think is a very powerful story. Um, they have built back of that success in the jewelry business, which is what my husband does today. His parents started the jewelry business. They at one point worked in New York City with his grandparents, all of them, both my mom's side and dad's side. They all lived in the same apartment complex next to each other. Personally, can't imagine this. Um, and they all worked in the same business together. They had several successful storefronts in New York City, but they, they were robbed several times and started to get scared of that and decided that maybe the nicer climate of Miami and their might be safer in Miami, although that's hard to imagine today, would, would be a place to relocate. So they had several successful uh, storefronts in Miami uh, until his parents pretty much moved out of the business and handed it over to my husband. It's now a mail order jewelry business, but also very, very successful. And everybody, as I mentioned, in his whole family and every Jew in, in Miami that I have personally met, but a lot at this point, are very successful business people. And so obviously that's a piece of the story here. Um, so. Some themes that emerged in so far my casual interviews with folks about what were the what were these experiences like again moving from one leaving one place to another and then another um, pretty much with nothing I mean, all the times so obviously there was changes in climate language food and in so many cases they changed their names they coming from Poland. <laughs> It was not warm. <laughs> the, cl the climate in Cuba was a dramatic change for folk for the folks. Her uh, Lilia, my, my mother-in-law's mo mother, moved when she was eight, so she said she she loved it. But the uh, older folks, her parents, great grandparents, had a hard time adjusting to the, the tropical climate. They knew no Spanish when they moved to a largely Spanish-speaking uh, country, um, so they had to from scratch learn and mostly teach themselves a new language. Same thing when they moved to the United States, they knew very little, if any, English. And yet they all knew Yiddish and, and largely Hebrew. And the importance of language also kind of shift, comes up here in a minute too. Obviously the foods were dramatically different that you would find in Eastern Europe than what you'd be having in Cuba. And many of them had to change their names or at least felt pressure to change their names. So my mother-in-law's mother was Nahama Shigo. Uh, when she moved to Cuba, she became known as Consuelo, which I guess is a loose translation of Nahama. Um, when they moved to the United States, my father-in-law's name was Itzhak Abraham, 
he felt that it was told that was a little too Jewish and foreign sounding in 1960. So he was pressured to refer to himself as Jack and he literally changed his name to Jack. His brother was Herschel Enrique. He's known as Henry. Um, so, and that was fairly common, I know, of, of immigrants to the United States, but to have the family history of changing many a time is fairly interesting. Um, my mother-in-law says the language piece was the most difficult, and they still do have a combination of Yiddish and Sp Spanish that they speak. When they moved here and had children, Lily and Jack, they felt that they really wanted their kids to learn Yiddish, and so all the kids and all the grandkids have either gone to Jewish school in addition to public schools or done a, a summer or a semester in Israel. It's been a very important value. And they speak this very interesting little combination sometimes. I know enough Spanish to kind of get by. I know about six words in Yiddish. <laughs> I haven't learned that to the same degree. And the cutest story, I think, of the combination, I won't, I won't be, belabor my stories, but uh, my mother-in-law was talking about a certain politician in Florida who she doesn't appreciate. And we asked her, you know, why does she not like this person? And she says, Porque es un putz, which means because he's a putz. And I think that's just the cutest little phrase. I'm like, what a great blend. Um, she also told me that they, they fly to Eastern Europe, of course, because of the fear and actuality of religious intolerance. And when they got to Cuba, they didn't really experience as much religious intolerance, but partly, she says, because the Jews largely stayed amongst themselves. They would go to Yeshiva, they would go to the Jewish cultural centers, and so she's like, we weren't mistreated per se by others, but we kind of formed a, our separate little group anyway. And many of the Jews actually like you know, married within that same group. In fact, one of the people in my presentation the other day said that his relatives who were, came over in the 20s, they actually had a practice of, they were, they were advised to on the way for a boat to get over to Cuba to find someone to marry if they had not or married because it was gonna be a little more likely to get entry and be accepted if they were already married. I thought that was again kind of interesting. Um, when they moved to the United States, however, they did experience more religious intolerance. Um, in 1960, there was still was fairly significant anti-Semitism in the United States, and especially again coupling that with the Jewish background, there was some people, some groups that they said were very sympathetic because they were sympathetic to anyone fleeing Castro, and then there were other groups that oh, I heard you're Cuban, I associate that with this nasty thing, therefore. Uh, you know, uh, you are come from you know that same background. What was really interesting is she argues that the, in Cuba they were a very racially tolerant society, and from what I can have gathered, that is largely true in terms of the Cuban Constitution actually requires uh, uh, anti. So the wording is escaping me, I'm sorry, it requires uh, egalitarianism in many respects in ways far stronger than the US Constitution. Um, that being said, there is some you know, racial intolerance in Cuba. It's not a completely egalitarian society, but she says they were shocked when they moved to the United States and found separate water fountains and separate facilities and things. She's like, that was unheard of to me. Um, sexual orientation and gender identity, for my mother-in-law's generation was not amazing in Cuba, but has dramatically advanced it from what I understand in, in recent years. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up, sorry, thank you, Mike. Um, other, other things, so despite having nobody in the family except my husband and his daughter ever going back to Cuba, there's this interesting Cuban pride, right, that they still have. There's a deep hatred, as many uh, people fleeing the regime have, of Castro and anything labeled communist or socialist, which has affected voting patterns in South Florida. My husband is very, 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 very politically left-leaning, as am I, and uh, he does his family have some deep debates about these things? Uh, but he did manage to, he's so proud, convince his mom, mother and father to vote for Joe Biden in the last election, which was the first time they'd ever voted anything that wasn't strictly Republican. They all, except for the younger generations, have a serious dislike of Obama because they saw him opening up relations with Cuba and trying to ease that ten, decades long tension, and they didn't, didn't, didn't agree with, with that. And then just to wrap up, the success piece. I think what I've been able to find is that Jews are very resilient people. You have to be if you're going to up and move <laughs> different places multiple times in your life. They also have serious work ethics. When his father passed away, the kids were asked by the rabbi when he was preparing the service, what was, what was the one thing you remember most about dad? And they said he never missed a day of work. Like just he was, they were hard, they are hard workers. Very strong belief in education. Uh, and like I mentioned, um, commitment to Jewish education as well as education. His family was Spanish in the home. You learned English at school, 
you're going to do you that you in Hebrew at Yeshiva. And they all were successful because they moved where they had family connections. And I think that's a pivotal piece. You know, my immigrant family up and moved to farming in Michigan and didn't know anyone there. And it's harder to get something started if you don't know anyone there. Okay. And so just to show you a couple little photos, this is my mother-in-law, Leah's mother, Nahama. That's her, she's a baby. This is her husband, Eko. You can see over here, Eko Shigel, that's how they spelled it in Eastern Europe. And that is her uh, documentation when she came there as Consuelo. Um, and just again, some other interesting documentation about their citizenship papers. Um, and yeah, uh, yeah, I guess I'll just wrap up with that. And then he became instead of Eco, Isaac. So Isaac and Consuelo Chico. So lots more I'd love to say, but I know I'm out of time. So I'm going to stop. And I would love to entertain questions and comments when uh, the other presenters are done. So thank you so much. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Gooch. Uh, thank you for being with me here today. I would like to start by saying thank you, Dr. Finley, for that presentation. His uh, talking about Cuban diaspora. Uh, I saw a lot of themes that we talk about when we talk about refugees and immigrants and so on and so forth. Right. So my expertise is also in uh, immigrant issues, specifically refugees uh, who will be settled uh, in Akron, Ohio. Uh, right. So I, in 2010, 2011, I was in Nepal working with Buddhist refugees at this refugee camp. And that's, that's a very important moment for me personally uh, in becoming uh, the academic client fit, right? I remember talking to colleagues and saying, you know, the world doesn't pay it enough attention to refugees. They should, they should stop talking more about refugees. Fast forward to today, I think people know about refugees, but you know, it's, it's a politically slanted uh, views in, in a lot of ways uh, that we have to sort of uh, go through and sort of try to get a nuanced perspective, right? Uh, speaking of talking about refugees, have you guys been Paying attention to immigrant news, refugee news, especially what happened in Martha's Vineyard, right? Like uh, asylum seekers were transported from Florida to Martha's Vineyard as a political stunt, uh, which reminds you we're in an election year, right? But to me, uh, in an interesting part of that story was I don't know if you caught it, once they were sent there, communities, organizations scrambled uh, to provide this warm reception, uh, warm welcome uh, to uh, these asylum seekers and migrants. And from my research, that is probably one of the most positive things I have found uh, for American society and the volunteers, uh, people who are willing to go out of their way uh, to make people who they do not, they do not know uh, welcome as best as they can, right? So these nuances at the grassroots level is probably the most uh, interesting thing, uh, the most important thing uh, we can talk about when we talk about refugees, refugees only, right? So again, my expertise is on uh, resell refugees, especially in Akron, Ohio, right? Uh, let's just do a quick sort of basic uh, sort of conversation, right? So maybe know what refugee cell process looks like. Yes, no? All right. In a very simple terms, it's a transfer of refugee families uh, from war zones or uh, you know refugee camps, and they're brought to a they they call it third third world. Oh, sorry, uh, third country resettlement, right? Uh, generally, it means the destination is a Western society. We're talking about the United States, Canada. United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, uh, that kind of thing, right? Now, uh, who's resettled? What kind of refugees are we talking about? It depends, right? I'm sure you guys heard about the Afghan refugees, right? You heard about the Ukrainian refugees because of war and so on. Now, I'm not going to go out of my way to claim that they're lucky or anything, right? But they were just, uh, as soon as they were displaced because of war, they were able to be uh, resettled uh, in many parts of Europe. Uh, and U.S. and so on, right? Now, the refugees that I worked with, Buddhist refugees, uh, they were displaced from their country, uh, Bhutan, in 1990, and they were in refugee camps for 18 years before the U.S. said, oh, you know, we can, we, we invite you to come to the U.S. and start your life all over again, right? So there are different sort of contexts when we talk about refugee camps. So I'm sure you heard of Vietnamese refugees as a consequence of Vietnamese, Vietnamese war in uh, the 70s and so on, right? Now, why? Uh, why does U.S. bring resell? Or why does the United States government resell refugees? Right now, if you look at the history from the 70s, 60s, 70s, there's a pretty robust history of bringing refugees. Right uh, at the highest, the, they would bring like 110,000 kind of refugees 
of course, it minimized during the Trump administration and so on, right? Now, the question is, why does the United States do that? Right? And that sort of goes into the heart of the political question, too. Right? Why bring in refugees? They don't have to. Right? So part of the reason is obviously humanitarian reasons, right? Oh, yeah, these guys have suffered a lot. Uh, let them them here. Let them allow, allow them to, you know, restart their life and so on. However, if you really look into uh, like how it works, I would even argue there's economic uh, sort of uh, economic co component to it, right? And that's sort of going to be a part of the future of my presentation today, right? Uh, now, when you ask where are the refugees resettled, right? Uh, refugees are being resettled to places like Africa uh, that has seen uh, economic decline, population loss for the last few decades, right? So you're putting refugees in that kind of area where, oh, you know what? You can go here settle down and, I don't know, create uh, equity, create uh, you know, capital uh, and things like that, right? So, so that's sort of the basic of uh, refugee settlement uh, as we move forward, right? Now, in the you know, research lens, right, again, I was working uh, with the refugees uh, in a refugee camp in 2010, 2011 uh, with the UN. So if you ever work with uh, refugees, right, one thing you realize is that the life is defined by this denial. Uh, denial of uh, political rights, uh, denial of you know uh, representation, religious representation, cultural representation, uh, and so on. So a lot of the rights that we, a lot of spaces that we take granted for a lot of times as citizens of a country, right? So my uh, question was: so if you bring your refugees in and resettlement, and you're promising them all these spaces, all these rights, all these privileges, eventually uh, citizenship of the United States of America, right? Then what does life look like, right? Does it mean everything? works out, or is there more nuance to how they negotiate these people, right? So my research focus is at a local level. Uh, so if you look, look at the trend of refugee resettlement, uh, where refugees and immigrants are selling right now, you'll see more and more of them are choosing places like Akron, which are not a huge city, uh, but like you know, urban, urban spaces, right? Uh, they're moving on from places like New York, Chicago, uh, you know, San Francisco, uh, LA to more like a uh, Midwest, Sort of suburban, semi urban areas. Right? So, my research is uh, sort of well, that data collection, at least, is based on you know, years of ethnic observations. Uh, we also did intervention programs uh, in the form of community dialogue, uh, listening projects, uh, and whatnot. Right? Again, the uh, site is Akron, Ohio, and it's a history of being a Russell society. Again, it's very important uh, because this is a place, uh, again, lost a lot of uh, population in the last few decades. You know. Uh, economic decline uh, and whatnot. And this is sort of the context where refugees have been brought in uh, as we speak of resettlement today. So uh, I always use this quote. As a matter of fact, I think I overuse this quote a lot of times in publication like this, right? Because for me, this quote speaks of the nuance that we don't always sort of use when we talk about refugees and immigrants, right? Uh, I was asking this person, like, what res resettlement is like? And his quote is, well, what would happen if you took the whole community from a refugee camp and put it in a place like Akron? Uh, we have all kinds of things here. We have good things, but we also have bad things, right? Uh, we have struggles, uh, we have challenges, and it's everything you can imagine, right? So when I uh, analyze how refugees behave, how refugees sort of adjust to their life and development, I'm looking at these spaces, right? As you can imagine, economic space is going to be very important because that's almost what we expect from them. Or you here now. What are you going to do for us? Right, you better get cracking in terms of uh, labor participation uh, and so on. Right, and I also look at how they sort of negotiate uh, within their own cultural space and political space. Right, as you can imagine, both cultural space and political space are also sort of driven by or affected by their economic status, uh, what what they're bringing to the table, uh, how they contribute. Okay, so within Akron, uh, this North Hill area is where a lot of these refugees uh, resettled, and that's where uh, my research was. Uh, I also worked with a lot of organizations that helped uh, resell these refugees, uh, you know, people, uh, allies, uh, and people like that who helped them uh, move forward. Right now, uh, just to give you a demographic, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly diverse uh, place, uh, North Hill. This is not the most up-to-date uh, stat, because this is before uh, we started reselling Afghan refugees and so on, right? But it gives you a pretty good snapshot of you know, a fairly diverse area. Uh, you see a lot of uh, Asian uh, sort of refugee population now. We also have increasing population of Hispanic uh, sort of immigrants, uh, even though they traditionally like to be 
like you say, private and even the ethnic so cross cultural connections there. All right, so economic space, right? Uh, so this is a question. So imagine you're refugees, you've been in a refugee camp for like 17, 18 years, maybe 20 years, and you finally get an invitation to the US. Say, hey, you can come here, you can bring your family here, right? So how long do you think it takes for you to be perfectly settled and then you know start contributing economically, socially, culturally, politically? How long do you think that, that transition lasts? So that's an important question to which you know there are no easy answers. Uh, but if you're coming in the US, you don't necessarily have a choice a lot of times. Most states it will give you three months. Three months of support, you know, will help you with the rent and everything. After three months, you better be ready to take care of your own family, right? So I want people to understand when you talk resettlement, the central emphasis is towards self-sufficiency, right? Uh, you come in in uh, what you have to start contributing, you have to be ready to provide for your family and not be dependent on the state. So there is that very important sort of emphasis right there, right? Some scholars talk about how we really look at resettlement, you know, it's a pursuit of ideal refugee, right? Uh, what do you think ideal refugee means? Working community economy. Working community economy, hopefully knows the language. If you don't know the language, that's fine. We have a lot of factories here, but you, you have to be able-bodied, you have to contribute, you have to take care of the family, right? So uh, as you can see, a lot of the refugees would be working in Nephi crops. As a matter of fact, if there is a settlement of refugees anywhere in Midwest, chances are they're working at some kind of meat type farm, right? Because that's where uh, the jobs are. You don't need to know a whole lot of language, even if you do, that's great. Even if you don't, that's fine. Uh, in Akron, uh, we recently opened an Amazon warehouse. Now that's where you see a lot of uh, youth working. So and so. Again, uh, so this is me trying to emphasize that uh, when we talk about bringing refugees, there is a very strong structural economic component to it, right? Most well, cities like Akron, uh, we've been losing residents for decades now, right? And we also been seeing a lot of economic decline. And this gap, as you can clearly see, is being killed by all the refugees uh, that we're bringing in, especially Buddhist refugees, Korean refugees, uh, and so on. Right. So, so within that network, within that sort of economic space, uh, within that sort of economic pressure. Uh, so how do refugees uh, sort of create their own agency, right? Now, what I, what I saw, what I noticed was that uh, there's more and more uh, creation of in, independent networks. At first, yes, you're dependent on organizations to tell you where to apply for jobs and so on. But within three, four years, they're starting to create their own independent networks, right? And uh, sort of going back to you know, the, the story about uh, in Florida, right? So we also have a very thriving scene of entrepreneurship, right? Here, uh, it's more about groceries, restaurants, and garments, right? And again, if you ever see a thriving immigrant community, these are the kind of businesses you're gonna see a lot, right? Why? So this is the theory of mixed embeddedness. So as a refugee, as an immigrant, a lot of times the, the doors to the mainstream economy is kind of close to you, right? We have doctors here, we have engineers, but they're not gonna be able to practice in the US because of a series of restrictions. So what do they do? They decide we're going to use whatever resources we have, whatever capital we have, and a lot of time that gets translated into opening groceries, opening ethnic restaurants, right, opening garment shops, and things like that. Right now, within that sort of uh, economic scenario, you will, I, I know I observe a lot of burden sharing, right. So there is not the sense of competition, like oh, I have this grocery store here, person B has a grocery store across the street. That's the competition, right? No, there's there's a lot of communication in terms of how we move forward, right? Because a lot of times they're struggling with things like uh, building codes, right? Uh, contractors, they, these were the people who just open, open a business and just start with their lives, right? But now they're having to figure out, oh, there are like two different people I need to talk about electricity, I need to get a loan, right? So there's a lot of uh, cross-cultural community or uh, within uh, community conversation in terms of how can we sort of address this together, uh, right? And also, uh, what I thought it was very interesting, that if you go to any of these uh, grocery stores or markets, it has become a hub for communal gathering. Right? Because if you, people come, they just talk. A lot of times, they're take, they're buying things on credit because everybody knows each other, right? Like, oh, I'll pay you next time. Right? right? So it has its own very unique form of entrepreneurship, right? Now, like, how does Akron feel about this 
and technology representation of refugees and immigrants that have brought to the city. Interestingly, people are okay with it, especially the business owners. They're like, yeah, this this store this storefront was empty for like five years. A hardworking immigrant is bringing the labor in. It's not dilapidated anymore. There are people coming in. I'm okay. Right. It is very interesting because I thought there would be more resistance. Now, there, there is resistance, but for the most part, people who work on the street fund, they're like, it's mostly a good thing. Yeah, I'm not going to complain about it. Right. right. Uh, there's some challenges, as you can imagine, of, uh, you know, uh, again, this is not the kind of place that is Manhattan, right? Uh, you know, the place where refugees, so a lot of times, have issues with crime, uh, violence, right? Uh, we still have, especially among youth, lack of appropriate opportunity of finding resources and using the capital and the talent they have. Because a lot of times it just means going back to the Amazon warehouse, uh, just working in your family's grocery store, right? Again, like I said, grocery can do the model and lucrative business model here to the point that they're creating competition within the community, right? Uh, so that seemed to be a little bit of an issue for a lot of the original uh, business owners as well. Right? And it's also interesting to see. Now, a lot of these owners, they want to expand. They want to, uh, they want to open more business stores, right? But they want to do it within the vicinity of where the population is, right? So uh, some of them actually have started uh, restoring in Cincinnati and Columbus. Why? It's because there is a thriving population of Indian Safali refugees there. Now, they wouldn't go to Cleveland, even though they will do well in Cleveland. They're like, no, I want to stay close to you know, my people up, who understand the produce, who understand sort of culture, uh, that we're trying to bring here. Right. All right. Uh, this political space, uh, I find it very interesting. Uh, so, if you're a refugee and you're being brought in the US, the first point of contact is going to be an organization. Uh, there are various different names. Uh, basically, we call them refugee resettling agencies, uh, right? So, these are the people who provide basic yet critical services, right? First point of contact in terms of, oh, where should you look for housing? Uh, this is the place where you should look for employment because you know they don't really need people who speak English. You can start here. They call it the chicken farm, right? The meat factory farm, things like that, right? They help you with citizenship classes. Uh, they help you with English classes, right? Uh, and, and the organization where I worked, uh, they were also specializing in uh, legal cases. If there's any issue in terms of citizenship, for example, right? This was the organization that would take care of uh, most of these things, right? Now, uh, is it what I found interesting was that. At first, at first glance, this organization seems to do everything for refugees, right? Like, oh, if you find this organization, they'll take everything. Turns out, not really. For the first three ish years, sure, they will provide all the resources, or at least they will have information about all the resources you need, right? But then when somebody comes in, like, uh, I have a new business now, where do I go to, you know, get a contractor? Or where do I need to, uh, you know, sign up for more customers? Or something like that? They don't have expertise on that, right? So uh, the organizations, the communities are starting to realize that, oh, a lot of our needs are being met, especially as we evolve into a fiber community, right? So uh, a lot of the communities started creating their own organizations that is like organizations around their own needs, right? So instead of relying on these organizations, they create their own independent services uh, in terms of, you know, giving language training, uh, providing uh, lessons on citizenship, because again, a lot of times, especially if you're not good in English, uh, getting citizenship uh, could be a problematic, could be a challenging experience, right? A lot of the priorities, uh, if you work with them, you realize they want to make sure everybody who wants to get employment, they have the resources, uh, they're very big on cultural representation. They want to be seen as the good refugees, the right refugees, the correct immigrants, nothing to do with uh, crime, nothing to get arrested, things like that, right? And one of the issues uh, they are trying to address uh, but limited success is taking care of what we call imperfect refugees, right? These are the refugees who cannot get employed, aka they're not the right kind of refugee, right? Uh, why do they cannot get employed? A lot of times it has to do with disability, a lot of the psychological issues they're carrying uh, from the refugee camps, right? Uh, there was also an issue of suicide rate in the community, which has gone down, uh, but these are some of the concerns uh, that were sort of being addressed uh, by this work. Now, in terms of how does Akron feel about uh, the whole sort of political action of uh, the refugee community, <laughs> for the most part, they don't really care. They're not really in tune with it, right? Uh, when we talk about political representation or actions of this community, 
uh, generally the people who know about it are the organizations. Right? Uh, these are the these are uh, our allies, people who've always been there, who volunteered, who always who been there, like kind of like the people who welcome the immigrants to part of the right? These are the people who care, who have always volunteered and try to understand who their neighbors are. Now, uh, as you can imagine, uh, for newcomers, uh, newcoming immigrants, right, uh, there is a dis disengagement when it comes to local politics. As much as we see them in all kinds of cultural and social things, uh, you know, their uh, representation in the economic front, it's really difficult to see them really being involved in right, so local politics, right? Even when there is direct threat to them, uh, you know, there have been cases where uh, students have been attacked. Because of their race, right? Uh, they had burglary. They would prefer not to create or think about it, right? Uh, for obvious reasons, right? But these are individuals who've gone through torture, who've gone through more than almost two decades of living in fear of authority, right? So that, that fear is still there, which sort of you know creates this barrier from being truly present in the local political scene, right? So whenever there is necessity of intervention, you usually see an organization. Uh, or an, an academic sort of organization, sort of creating an intervention program that brings them in conversation with the locals, right? Uh, generally, uh, you would find residents going out of their way, like, hey, you know, this is something wrong here, we need to talk about it. It usually falls upon the organizations to sort of uh, identify that and, and try to sort of address that. Now, uh, college of space creation. Now, this is a, uh, again, as you can imagine, uh, the refugee presence is kind of insular uh, when it comes to sort of cultural representation. They want what they want is after almost two decades of denial of their identities, uh, you see them celebrating a lot of vibrant ways, you know, religious celebrations, uh, cultural celebrations, right? Like they just want to celebrate who they are uh, as best as they can. Now, uh, there is some contestation of identification, right? Like, uh, for example, in the Indian Mahali community. We ask them about identities. There is, there is no unified answer. Some people claim, yeah, we, we, we were born in Pakistan. Some people claim we lived in Nepal for so long. We have your Pakistan. Yeah, for the younger generation, we're America. We're American citizens, right? So, so there's conversation over that. However, when it comes to cultural unity, it, it's, it's pretty unified. I think. I, like they really take pride in uh, inviting people over, having these like, Hindu celebrations, having these like, like, Diwali. Uh, and things like that, right? Because for them, that culture is what truly, truly for, uh, represents them, uh, right? So you'll see once every year around October, November, they have these big celebrations where they not only invite uh, their own community members, you have, you know, Mexican immigrants, uh, Burmese immigrants, uh, right? Uh, Congolese immigrants, uh, you have mayor salaries, right? So for them, this cultural representation is the best way of presenting themselves uh, to the community, uh, right? Now, as you can imagine, what that does is that it kind of makes an insular to society, uh, to, to the rest of the city. Now, if you happen to be organization, if you happen to be volunteers who are always in close contact with them, yes, you're you're part of those functions, you're part of those celebrations, but it doesn't really extend itself to the rest of society, the rest of the city, uh, unfortunately. Right? So it kind of makes an insular uh, in many ways. Right? So, so this is, again, sort of like a character representation of uh, what I'm talking about so far, right, in terms of how they negotiate with all space, political space, cultural space, right? So I think uh, one key point would be the connection with both society, right? You can imagine so there is more tacit acceptance in terms of uh, economic participation because of what concretely they bring uh, to the city, right? But when it comes to political space, public space, the results are kind of mixed. Like, you know, you're not really, uh, seeing them engage with the whole society for them in a meaningful uh, sort of manner uh, in the long term, right? Now, and I'm running out of time. Uh, so just a few things that I want to bring up is that, so my whole point is when you look at immigrant refugees, it's best not to see them as a homogenous group, right? These are individuals, but you, you'll see uh, that there's nuance to their allocation, uh, right? So that's why I'm trying to look at them in various different spaces, right? As you can imagine, uh, there is more of an economic participation because of how we sell the structure, uh, but you will not see an overexpression of uh, food 
right? Uh, you see them also programs. If there's a console program acronym, trust me, you see them, right? However, if there is like a protest about the rental demand that happened in the place I was seeing, we all were there, but you didn't see a lot of rental because we want to keep the head down. We're already here, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to be the person to sort of be a statement of that, right? So obviously you have to use uh, plug in economic gap in a lot of places in America. Now, a lot of people consider that to be a unified or unanimous success story, right? I would say, please look beneath uh, the surface. I do a lot more than one of how that success story is created. Now, uh, as they get getting insular and they find revenue increase in active living in ethnic silos, there are consequences uh, for the particular community. Uh, a lot of it in terms of the psychological health, uh, economic challenges, as well as uh, political power. And as an immigrant, I tell you, well, it's great to live in America, but if you don't have political power these times, it feels like something for something like that. I don't know who you can say or not. Anyway, so that, that's all I have for you guys. Uh, I'll, I'll be happy to hold your questions later. Thank you. It's so hard to go last because you get immersed in what <laughs> others are saying, and then you're like, wait, what am I doing? So um, I'm curious to see the first two presentations and the conversation. Um, so I'm Um, so my name is Colleen. I'm from the Earl of School of Religion. And today I'm talking about um, a congregation, a new congregation called Freedom Church of the Poor, and thinking about it as a space for nurturing peacemakers. So Freedom Church of the Poor, it's, a, it's an online congregation that first gathered in the midst of the COVID-19 public health crisis. And for two and a half years, we've gathered with the purpose of becoming a spiritual home for movement leaders and a place to help nurture moral leadership for the struggle to end poverty, systematic racism, ecological devastation, militarism, and the false moral narrative of Christian nationalism. And so I wanna start jumping directly into a clip from a recent service and, and then circle back to a little more about the, the origins and vision and form. Yeah, just 
in this grassroots organizer, Ms. Rodrigo, starts an hour long service um, with a report from the field. She's literally in her car coming, coming from these actions, um, a week of action um, in a multi state healthcare team, healthcare campaign called the Nonviolent Medicaid Army. Uh, so NISB is in Pennsylvania, but that, that project has spread to several states. Um, and the, the imminent Medicaid cutouts are looming large for, for that campaign. And for many in the Freedom Church of the Poor congregation, which gathers on Facebook Live, um, this was not the first time they've heard from the nonviolent Medicaid Army. Um, some are part of the nonviolent Medicaid Army in that campaign. Um, and so it initially opens the service and then it continues to um, a scripture reading often from the Hebrew Bible or Christian Testament, but, but not always, um, followed by two to three short homilies or reflections, tying the text to current organizing campaigns, uh, public policy issues, current events, other, other justice issues. Um, and then and these respondents are um, a combination of religious leaders, whether ordained or, or lay religious leaders, organizers like Nijmi, um, and some um, academics and people coming from other states. All companies are followed by a period of open responses, and both through the chat on Facebook Live, but then also those who are like have a role in the service gather on Zoom, and then we broadcast Zoom. So those that are in the Zoom room together can have a conversation also um, in that open response. Um, and so music is mixed in, there's music at the beginning and going in, and those artists come from the organizations and, and campaigns that are taking part. And then the service usually ends with um, a responsive prayers of the people, and again, using the chat. Uh, I want to mention here that um, I'm part of this congregation and was part of the collectivity that contributed to the formation. So this isn't a disinterested or formal study of the organization, but more of a model sharing out of this work. Um, so I definitely welcome critical and academic questions about it. I have some as well. Um, but this, this is more of a model sharing in the spirit of the call for papers, um, nurturing the call of the service. And then I also want to mention up front that, that the phrase, um, that the name Freedom Church of the Poor is taken as, as Nijmi spoke to a little bit, but this phrase is taken from Martin Luther King Jr. in 1967. Uh, and he's making reference to black abolitionist freedom churches, including the denominations African Methodist Episcopal and AME Zion. Those were the original freedom church denominations. Um, and he uses that example of religious leadership of the oppressed um, in calling for the 1968 Poor People's Campaign. Uh, and here's that larger text that comes from from Martin Luther King um, in 1967, talking about the Bulls in 1968, which actually takes place after he's assassinated. Um, so he says, the dispossessed of this nation, the poor, both white and black, live in a cruelly unjust society. They must organize a revolution against the injustice, not against the lives of the persons who are their fellow citizens, but against the structures through which the society is refusing to take means which have been called for and which are at hand to lift the load of poverty. The only real revolutionary, people say, is a person who has nothing to lose. Millions of people on the street care for freedom, nothing to lose. If they can help to act, take action together, they'll do so with a freedom and a power that will be a new and unsettling force in our complacent national life. Beginning in the new year, 1968, we will be recruiting 3,000 of the poorest citizens from 10 different urban and rural areas to initiate and lead a sustained, massive, direct action movement in Washington. That's the fourth people's campaign. Those who choose to join this initial 3,000, this nonviolent army, this freedom church of the poor, will work with us for three months to develop nonviolent action skills. Um, and I don't know if you catch the echo here, but the nonviolent army is where the, um, the nonviolent Medicaid army takes its name as well. Um, so going back to the, the congregation, Freedom Church of the Poor, um, uh, I want to let Becca Forsyth 
share the mission statement instead of rereading it um, on what that would be. I would like to just cut out by letting you know what the mission statement of the Freedom Church is for. The mission of the Freedom Church is before is to be a spiritual home for movement leaders and a place to help nurture moral leadership for the struggle to end poverty, systemic racism, ecological devastation, militarism, and the false moral narrative of Christian nationalism. We reject the religion of empire, which blames the poor for their poverty pits poor and dispossessed people against each other and promotes the false narrative that poverty cannot be ended, only alleviated through charity. The Freedom Church of the Poor began meeting in March of 2020, just as the COVID-19 pandemic was breaking out in the United States. The Freedom Church comes together in these times out of necessity to help end a system that is killing us. We are a loose network of workers, poor folk, pastors, organizers, thinkers, and fighters. We are bound together by our conviction that the world does not have to be this way, and that this is not as good as it gets, because God created abundance for all, not just for a few. We are interfaith interspiritual and non-religious and come from every region of the country. We welcome all who wish to be a part of the movement and all victims of the empire. I'd like to welcome one of our sisters and brothers from La Iglesia del Pueblo to uh, like to welcome one of our I'll say a word about La Iglesia, La Iglesia in just a moment, uh, but I wanted to pause here on the, the mission and vision. Um, and so you, you can see this emphasis on um, like distorted moral narratives about poor people. Um, and, and also this emphasis, of, like it's interesting. So the congregation includes people who come from um, different religious traditions, people who don't identify as being religious, people who think of themselves as the nuns or the knots. And, um, and it is a, um, it's, it's interesting. I think it could be interesting to sort of trace how that works and whether that works. And in some ways, what, what ties people into this congregation is, um, is in some ways religious second or something. And I, I would, I'd be interested in thinking about that. And so, um, what what is what the, what then becomes you know pulling people together is um, is is in this mission and vision, but um, you know how is it that they're able to come together in a religiously in a in a in a way that sort of you know people come in and out and depending on what the the service is in a particular week, um, but there is often Hebrew and Christian Testament texts. And I would say that the that largely, like it, it's and culturally, it feels like sort of a like a low church Protestantism, progressive Protestantism in 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 form, but then sort of with a with a little bit of a different emphasis, including that it is very much thinking about biblical texts, and that that there is often um, an emphasis on on those texts and how they tie to. The organizing work that we're doing is sort of reading reading the Bible to hear those stories and reading the Bible as a as a as a book about poor people. Um, and so I want to play uh, an example from Reverend West McNeil of one of just a section of her like short homily or response that's tied to the scripture from that week. Um, and this was from the um, the week that um, Nishmi opened. In this final verse in the past. Of Jeremy talks about the yearning to eat. He says, Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes without women of tears, so that I might weep day and night for the slain of my people. I think there's such wisdom in that prayer. I know that 
too often my instinct is, is to turn away from grief or pain. But whose interests was that served? If we don't weep and mourn for our people, who will? And so I'm grateful for this reminder from Jeremiah and, and in our network and movement these past few months that there are times when we have to join the wails of God and the wails of the prophets who came before us. And I think out of that, we can, in a way, be a, a source of healing and sustenance for those whose losses have been ignored or covered over, which has happened so much in these last few years. And that in making space for us to be together and grieve together and mourn together and fight together, we can even be part of that, that balm that bomb and Gilead that, that the prophet seeks. And then I want to play a clip of um, Reverend Dr. T.J. Bua, who's from the Methodist Theological Seminary of Ohio. Um, and this is a from a different week, but a prayers of the people that, that's at the end. Um, and you can see here that she's watching the chat for prayer concerns and sort of taking prayer concerns from, from the, the online gathering. Breathing of just centering yourself and inviting uh, you all to, to share your prayer requests. And as you all are breathing, I uh, will just say spirit of the living God, uh, all fresh on each one of us. Prayers for Janina and her family as they struggle with the criminalization of mental illness, we are paying, uh, praying for those of us who find themselves with uh, degrees and are paying a good portion of our paychecks to student loan companies. We are praying for those of us who uh, are organizers who are on the front line, who, as Brother Keith said, is operating. Um, in the agenda of the spirit, and who, uh, as all of our speakers have reminded us that we are unloaded to work for a release to help people to be permitted to live and to live fully. So, um there are also two sibling congregations uh, that are part of, of this. One is La Iglesia del Pueblo, and they meet weekly, and then monthly we have a combined service. Um, and, and then Freedom Shul of the Poor, um, which comes together for Passover and high holidays. And they, um, they have a mission that to be a spiritual home for movement leaders, Freedom Shul is for everyone. Jewish leaders searching for a community and a spiritual home rooted in a movement led by poor and dispossessed people, as well as anyone else who finds meaning and connection with its metaphorical and in this case, virtual walls. Um, so just um, in the last few minutes, I, I just wanna say a word about how Freedom Church came to be. Um, in 2019, the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice, which is based in um, uh, at Union Theological Seminary, convened a group of organizers, um, religious leaders, again, ordained and not, and biblical scholars around a methodology of biblical interpretation called Reading the Bible with the Poor. It's a contextual liberationist approach that grew out of biblical interpretation in US social movements, but inspired by global models of uh, contextualized um, the Bible study. Um, and then the cohort came together around the question, how can we use the reading the Bible with the poor methodology to develop faith and moral leaders for the movement to end poverty and to shift the narrative about poverty in the academy, the church, and society? And so we planned a series of exchanges, um, in-person visits to grassroots organizations across the country to begin in 2020. Um, so this this changed, this, you know, this plan changed quickly um, as we were scattered out of common spaces, including in our organizing work, um, there was an opening for doing something um, along the lines of what the cohort, cohort had planned now in an open 
and um, like worship focused setting. And so this is how Freedom Church of the Poor uh, got started and then um, kept going. So within this call is a commitment to the leadership of the poor, including religious leadership. And it comes from assess an assessment that across history, religious leadership has rarely come from religious institutions. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, the church is too often a taillight instead of a headlight. And yet religious leadership has been a critical part of every US social movement. And that leadership has come from the margins, from those who are most impacted by the crisis at hand and most able to see the necessity of broad <coughs> systemic change, to see the hypocrisy of the church taking sides with violence and oppression. These leaders across history have been strengthened by their own confessions of faith and interpretations of sacred scriptures. Black Freedom Church theologies nurtured abolitionist movements, social gospel ideas, pro-labor movement, Black social gospel undergirded the long history of, of civil rights. And these leaders called the rest of the nation to join them. They drew from their religious and moral convictions, including reading the Bible that was so often read as evidence against their cause in liberatory ways. This project nurtures religious leadership within and beyond the walls of churches, where formal education is sometimes a barrier to ordained religious leadership, even among those who feel called to it. Religious leaders who are organizing in their communities and workplaces find themselves in the story of the Bible and God's promise to always be with us and see freedom in it. For some questions, comments, discussion, we have any of those. 